Good morning. It's Friday. Yay. Another week of hashtag LD Edu chat completed or nearly. Today we have Oliver Caviglioli, um, who will be looking at dual coding with teachers. Absolutely fascinating topic um, that I'm really looking to find out more about myself. Um, and I have tweeted out the link for uh, Oliver's uh, website earlier this morning. Uh, do follow at Chilton TSA, at Chilton TSA to find out more about the work that Oliver does. Obviously in the hour that we have, we're only gonna be able to go to a certain level, um, but we will try and give you the answers to the questions that you pose during the session as much as possible. Thankfully on uh, hashtag LD EduChat, we have got a fantastic lineup of um, sessions coming up in the last a few weeks of our academic year and we've also got some amazing announcements as well about what's coming up so do watch this space over the next week or so we'll be letting you know and giving you the information about what's coming up next we won't just stop we will continue and to help you develop and give you some free resources and support in in, in the months ahead without further ado let's jump straight into oliver's session Hello, I'm Oliver Caviglioli. Welcome to this very short introduction to dual coding theory. Why I'm doing it because dual coding is now an acknowledged strategy in the repertoire of cognitive science techniques available to teachers. But I think it's little or misconceived, little known and misconceived. So I'm gonna help your understanding by saying that there are two stories related to dual coding. The first is kind of well known and the second is almost not known at all. And yet it's this second story that has the most significance and power for teachers. Let's have a look at these two stories. I'm going to start by explaining dual coding theory very briefly in terms of cognitive load theory. So as you know, we have a limited working memory and perhaps the most important yet hidden relationship in classrooms is, is how teachers manage students' working memory and their long-term memory. One is extremely constrained and limited and the other seemingly unlimited. Now, in terms of working memory, we receive information through our eyes, visual stimuli, and we also receive verbal information. And I guess for evolutionary purpose, we can explain that these are two separate channels. So very cleverly and ingeniously, when it's dark, we can still hear things. So these are two channels that work separately to each other. They can work at the same time and still be separate. And information never travels from one to the other. So we're going to work out how these two totally separate channels can in some way collaborate to create what we know as dual coding theory. Alan Pivio, whose theory this is invented in the early 1970s, has some really complicated ways of describing what happens to this information in working memory. Badly and Hitch give us a far more effective metaphor, the visuospatial sketch pad. So the amount of information we can take in visually and store in temporary fashion is really quite limited. Um, and so the image of a very tiny sketch pad shows you how few images you can recall in your working memory. And similarly so, if you think of a very tiny old fashioned piece of tape, once that tape gets filled up, by recording sound, then it's over. You either have to uh, record over what you had stored or refuse to listen to any more and just carry on playing the same recording. So this really colourfully illustrates our working memory. Now, although they are separate, these two channels do in some way communicate. They make connections. Pivio calls it associative connections. So, for example, when you're learning a foreign language and you're learning French and you want to know the word for cat, you can have an image of a cat and you'd have the word chat. And at this point, it's really, really important to notice that Pivio's several decades of research was with cognitively unchallenging material, just simple stuff you need to learn off rote. He was simply re researching how we can retrieve these simple things. So an image and the word sha join together, pair up, tether. And in the learning process, which you'll know psychologists try and confuse us by calling it encoding, the concept gets encoded twice, once with the word, once with the image, and thus we get the term 
dual coding. Going into long-term memory, it leads what Professor Paul Kirshner calls a double memory trace. And it's why he calls dual coding double-barreled learning. So the other side, in terms of the retrieval process, we double the chance of it being retrieved because it's been encoded and has a memory trace, which can be triggered either by the word or the image, or indeed both. And this is what I'm calling story number one. It's what dual coding is known as, quite rightly. It's quite useful. And if it was only that, I could stop now because there's nothing more to say about it. It's about learning simple stuff. It's not about expanding and challenging children's conceptual understanding. Now, Paivio did write something else, which is the basis of story number two, which is far more significant, far more complex, and far more useful for teachers in classrooms. So let me explain story number two by starting with Paivio himself. Paivio, in his book, in his 1990 book, Mental Representation, explains that the structure of visual and auditory information differ in the fact you'll know that words are structured sequentially in a linear fashion, but you may not have considered that the very nature of visual information is that it is non-linear. And this structure has significance with regard to how it is processed. So linear information, text, hearing or reading is sequential processing. And that in itself, Paivio says, contains cognitive constraints. It's difficult to do. Whereas images are, are processed in what Paivio calls sometimes synchronous processing and sometimes simultaneous processing. That doesn't mean you look at a diagram as you are now and all the elements within it, you take it all in exactly at the same time and you understand it all instantly. You know, it's not magical. But what it means is that all the elements are available to you simultaneously. And by scanning around the diagram, you create meaning by noticing the relationships, the visual relationships of the elements, and this gives you meaning. Now, later psychologists, and within Paivio's era, did some research on this. Larkin and Simon wrote the first paper in 87, in which they proposed that sequential processing of text is harder than images, and he called this the visual argument, in which subjects were given either a well-formed diagram or a piece of text, and they were asked questions about it. And those that were given the text provided more accurate answers than those that were provided the text only, and their retrieval was better. So therefore he provided, he, he, he created this term, the visual argument, in which text was seen to be computationally less efficient and diagrams more efficient. We're having an exercise soon where we're going to test this out. Now, I call this story number two, and the significance is story number one, the simple story of dual coding, is about the verbal and the visual. But story number two significantly is about the, the verbal and the visuospatial. And the visual part isn't that significant. The visual part is only the means whereby we access the spatial relationships. So children and adults with little or no sight can be given, in fact, are given simple diagrams that are put through an embossing machine and they access the spatial relationships between the elements with their fingers, which is harder, takes longer, more prone to misinterpretation or mistakes. So the visual access is really efficient, but it's not the important part. The important part in which concepts can be really efficiently explained is the visuospatial relationships. So did you follow that okay? I guess so. I broke up the explanation step by step and the image developed in line with my explanation and you weren't overloaded at any one time. It's really quite easy to follow. I want to let you know that on my day course, I have half the participants have their turn around and have their back to the screen. So they experience the same verbal explanation and with no visual. And then perhaps rather cruelly, and I'm on purposely being cruel, I pounce on people and ask them to give me a summary of what I've said. And I've rarely met anyone who can achieve that.
is so difficult because it exemplifies one of the cognitive load theory effects called the transient information effect. So words just disappear. And when you're receiving novel information that doesn't directly and obviously link to your prior knowledge, you're in trouble. What that exercise could also show in addition for you learning about story number one and story number two. Now let's go on and do another exercise. So now we're going to see what story number two feels like in terms of your experience. And this is what we're going to test out. So gird yourself. Here we go. I'm going to present you with a piece of text. It's very short text and the vocabulary is very simple. The grammar is not complicated either. And finally, the subject matter is something that you'll be very familiar with. It's a project across departments or faculties. I'm going to present it to you and really quite rapidly, because it doesn't need much investigating, I'm going to ask you three questions, which obviously I'm not in person, I can't pounce on you, uh, but I'm going to ask you to have your best effort to try to answer it. Here it goes. Right, you should have all read that. You probably want to go back and read certain parts of it, no doubt. But here come the questions. So go ahead, answer it. Write the answer down, get a sheet of paper. Make yourself accountable. Who's the highest ranking person in the Modern Europe project? That should be efficient, that should, you know, should be easy to find out. It's there, it's in front of your eyes. Move on, which department has the most people in the Modern Europe project? No lagging, come on. It tells you. And question number three is slightly more difficult. You have to make an inference. It doesn't directly tell you. Just work it out. If I were with you now, I'd be walking around the room amongst you and I'd be teasing you, I'd be taunting you, I'd be saying, how comes you can't answer it? Maybe right now, your experience is abstract concept notion I talked about, computational inefficient. A lot of text is computationally inefficient. It is far more complex than the ideas you're trying to convey. Let me contrast this by something which is computationally highly efficient. I'm going to talk, I'm going to show you a diagram of the Modern Europe project to show you how simply diagrams compared to text can convey information and understanding. Now have a look. It is self-evident. I've colour coded it. I even put a border around the container that is the Modern Europe project. Who's the highest ranking person in the Modern Europe project? I mean, the answer is immediate. It's Harry, obviously. Which department has the most people? You just need to count. There are more people in the geography department. You know, you, and which people are not involved? Well, you simply look at those outside of the Modern Europe container. It's self-evident. What advantage is there in making concepts more complicated than they are other than disenchanting children and making them create internal narratives about themselves that they're not very clever. I see no advantage whatsoever. Computational efficiency. Who wouldn't want it? So how are you doing? I think we need to talk about what happened. I think we need to start to explore why it is that people with an education who are really good at reading and writing and talking and listening probably failed quite dramatically in that exercise. I know it's awkward. I know it's not natural language. It's, uh, it's been deliberately designed to cause you discomfort for you to fail. But nonetheless, it's a real surprise that I was able to do that. So I'm going to give you one explanation which sounds beguilingly confusing. Barbara Tversky, a renowned psychologist who's been looking at the cognitive significance of visual explanations, says the reason behind it, the underlying deep reason, is that spatial thinking is the foundation for our abstract thought. So pre-linguistically, before we had language, we learned certain logics. No one taught us it. We learned, for example, that when we pour water into a cup and the level goes up, the more water you have, the higher the level. And so we internalize the logic where 
up is more. So when I asked you a question, who's the highest ranking person? And then you had one above the other, you knew that our culture assumes that the person above has more of a quality we're talking about. It could be morality, it could be status, it could be age, it could be whatever we're talking about. Even spirituality, where we transcendent spirituality is higher. We learned that logic. And there are many other logics that we learned. One of them, going back to the idea of pouring water in a cup, is a container. A container contains things, and something is either in the container or out the container. And we can have, as children know, with the cups, you can have a small container with a bigger container. And essentially, that's the logic, which is absolutely no different to Aristotle's notion of categorization. And so the reason why that diagram is more, more effective for you, because we tapped in to our essential primitive pre-linguistic logic about how we know the world works. So let's look at the next slide and see what you can do about that as a teacher. So here we have a teacher. And the thing that you can't normally see, but you can in my diagram, is the teacher's schema. It's enormous, it's elaborate, it's complex, it's interwoven, it's a net of connections. And this thing is private, so it's really valuable. I mean, possibly the most valuable thing in the classroom. And the thing's private, which is a problem from the very start. And so it's also invisible. And yet teachers do a really good job at transforming that non-linear web of network into a string of words, into a verbal explanation. However, the words are formless. They have no shape. They can't be seen, they can't be manipulated, and particularly so as they're transient, they disappear. And so it doesn't take long for another human to suffer by being overloaded, particularly when new information has been communicated simply with words. But how you can alter that dynamic between teacher and pupil is really quite easy and quite simple. So here you have the same teacher with the same invisible schema and the same transformation of non-linear web of information into a string of words. But now what can also happen is the teacher can project externally some of that schema. You'll notice this projected schema isn't as wide and as complex as that in the teacher's head. Like with any bit of information, you need to judge the level of complexity with regard to your, your audience's prior knowledge. And so here we have a model. And perhaps we insufficiently explain the importance of models. They are deliberate simplifications in order to better explain. So there we have a model which would accompany step by step the teacher's explanation. And this model itself is public. So what previously was private and internal is now public. What previously was abstract is now concrete. And what previously was transient, fleeting, is now permanent. So students' working memory isn't overloaded with simply trying to remember what the teacher said. And all of it can now be devoted to a deeper analysis and meaning making of the nature of that statement. That is the simplest way to explain to somebody who hasn't seen dual coding uh, in, in action before the ideas behind it and the theories behind it, which uh, as time goes on have been proven to be effective and also they also have an impact in terms of um, how we transfer what we have as teachers to students are the ones that need to know it. Just to remind you over on Twitter today, we've got um, another Twitter takeover today at Chilton TSA. Make sure you go on there and follow us. Lots more information uh, will be made available. And as you can probably just tell, um, I mean, what a way to start a Friday talking about dual coding theory. And if you haven't seen that before, if you haven't seen it uh, in action in your school before, it is definitely something if you're looking at from a uh, specifically from a teaching and learning perspective within your schools and how you move forward, it must be something that you try and incorporate as strategies to 
bed down the, the whole process that we're now looking at in terms of review and recall and how can you make the time that we have with our students the most effective. And I have tweeted out, and I'm no, no doubt Oliver will, and so will everybody else, the, the website where a lot more of this information is found. And I'm sure he'll engage in conversations beyond today as well if you've got more questions and more support that you need with this aspect of, of learning. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Oliver Caviglioli to the stage, to the e-stage. Hello, hello everybody. Brilliant. Um, so, I mean, I mean, as you said, I mean, most of the topics we cover, we only ever skim at the surface. And I feel that with a topic like this, we're only ever going to even scratch the surface in terms of people's understanding and developing their knowledge. So, um, so thank you for putting that together. And I know that trying to make something as complex, as concise for 20 odd minutes is actually no mean feat to make sure that you're picking the right information. <laughs> Um, that's going to deliver the message that you want to deliver. So, um, so I'll take my, my uh, virtual hat off to you. Everything's virtual these days. I don't even have a hat. And I know um, the work that you do is immense and, and, and the level of content that you have on your website is also immense as well. Looking at the questions, where do you want to jump to first, Oliver? Probably one of the most difficult questions is Mary Ziegler asked, really, in essence, um, isn't it better if students produce their own diagrams and the answer is it depends so frederick reef in his book applying cognitive edu um, science to education says that novices and you have to assume that for the most part students are novices facing unfamiliar material don't know how to organize unfamiliar material so what would happen if you let novices try and organize unfamiliar material they're hardly probably going to organize it inaccurately. And the act of looking, thinking, drawing, and manipulating a map is really powerful in terms of memory. And what they're likely to be remembering is something which is incorrect. Mm -hmm. So there's probably one golden rule in education, which, well, it's my golden rule, is a really attempt to make sure that students don't learn something incorrectly. You don't add to their misconceptions mm. because undoing that it just takes so much more effort. And in some cases, you know, you never undo a misconception. So it's true that creating your own Mac makes it more memorable. And it's also true in that unless the students are some way along, away from the novice towards the expertise continuum, because it's not binary, you know, if there's a continuum, and unless they're supported, there's a danger they'll be learning the wrong thing. But when they are further along, and if they have been explicitly taught and scaffolded by the teacher, then yes, it's better for them also to create their own diagram. And to make it more complicated still, Lyons and Clark in their 2004, 450 page review of graphics for learning, say that the biggest mistake that teachers make is they choose the wrong visual. So you've got the opportunity, so you've got the danger of a student, novice, doing it incorrectly, learning the incorrect things and doing it inefficiently because they've chosen the wrong visual. So scaffolding is everything in that respect. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, um, like you said, when, when, when a student or even we learn this way, it um, makes it more permanent. Yes. So uh, even more crucial that when we are using this methodology, that we get it right. Is there time within, because a lot of schools focus on um, developing students with these skills in terms of um, take, uh, taking in the information in different ways. So writing notes, cataloging or uh, instructions, uh, creating diagrams and spider diagram, all those different things. That, uh, do you think we have enough time within our, within secondary schools or primary schools to actually develop the skills from somebody who's a novice to becoming more expert in being able to do that for themselves? Do we actually have time with the curriculums that we have? That's a great question. First of all, I wouldn't teach them how to use any diagrams. Mm. I think that's the, completely the wrong way to start, but yep. it's always where everybody else starts. So first of all, I want to say that on my course, at the beginning, I tell, pe I tell teachers this, and it sounds absurd, and, and, and really quite early on, they see it's true. Teachers are information designers. They design information. So they, we, they learn lots of complex material and then they design it, they, they curate it in order to 
teacher at the right level for their students. So it is possible to analyze information as being of four particular types. Hmm. We either define something, we chunk it, we compare it, we sequence things, so temporal relations, or we find causal relations. And when I was a trainer, I spent pretty much 20 years asking teachers to embarrass me and, and prove me wrong and find me a piece of their subject knowledge which, which wasn't one of those or hybrids of those four types of information. Hmm. I never found one once. So hmm. I also know primary schools who can teach this notion in one lesson to students, which means thereafter, every time a teacher introduces a new topic, they would say, we're looking at this new topic. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a structure of what it consists of. So we're going to define and the student will all go define. And then, so now we're going to compare it to this other thing we learned last term. And they all go compare. So very, very shortly, they can, they can parse knowledge as one of these four types. Only then is it safe to teach them a diagram. Otherwise, if you teach them a diagram, it's just a trick. Yeah. They'll, they'll do it incorrectly. The teacher's not able to explain why this diagram, not another. So it ends up being, why did you choose that diagram? And teachers answer this, oh, I like it. So I've often struggled to find a polite way to tell teachers that's bonkers. So <laughs> I've now got a story. So you imagine me, I'm a, I'm a 16 year old. I've turned up my first day on a building site. My mother's unfortunately has washed an eye in my jeans. So I look a bit of a twerp anyway. And I meet the foreman and I delve into my kit bag, which is really empty. And I just take out a chisel. And gormlessly I say, I like chisels. You know, it's bonkers. So what you do is on a building site depends on the material and the task you need to do. Yeah. Then you choose your tool. Yeah. Exactly the same with graphic organizers or any diagram. So starting off with use any tool you fancy. It's just like using a chisel to saw something. Yeah. You must know the type of information. So there's what's happening in education at the moment. There's a kind of a bit of a war happened on. We've decided we haven't had enough focus on a curriculum. So now we scorn all pedagogy as if that's not as important. Graphic organizer is interesting. It is an expression of your cognition and you can only re really make sense when your starting point is the curriculum content. So it's the one strategy that fuses pedagogy and curriculum content. You have to start with the content. Absolutely. So is that um, not that long winded answer? No, 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 spot on. And I think you made me and probably a few others laugh along the way, which during a dual coding discussion, I think is, is, is another feat that you've accomplished. <laughs> um, where do you want to jump to next? Uh, do you have any practical suggestions for classroom approaches for language heavy subjects? Well, yeah, well, let me just tell you, recently I had an author whose book I'm going to illustrate. Um, he interviewed me and I taught him how to, well, I took an abstract notion that psychologists are now talking about, um, that we regard, the mind regards ideas as objects. So, you know, I told you earlier on that we have this pre-linguistic logic about more is up. There are many others. Well, from that, all our abstract ideas are really no different to when we were young and we played with bits of wood and we moved them around. We built things, we spread them out, we split them up, we put them into long lines. That's all we do with ideas. Mm. So if you get us, by the way, a trick with post-it notes is use the smallest post-it note with the thickest pen. So you're not <laughs> writing paragraphs, it's like a single word. So one word on a post-it note is an idea, is an object. Then you put them all out in front of you and the first thing you do is you work out, do we need to do any culling? Have we said the same things with different words? So you cull it, that makes a big difference. And then you chunk it, let's put it into groups. And then you have to chain it. So you, all communication eventually is sequential in nature. So then you find what's the best order. So you're creating a rationale, a narrative. So this person had been struggling for many, many hours on one particular chapter. He did this. And he mastered it in 10 minutes. He said, I feel I was mastering the information. So that's my introduction to the answer, which is you have to divorce yourself from what you're so good at. 
narratives, written or spoken, the beautiful flow, and just get almost mechanical and break it up and just say, what am I saying? Mm -hmm. I'm a bit journalistic. What am I saying? Is this more important, less important? It, what are the two main themes? So now all the content, which, which of those things do they belong? And there's some kind of higher order, some hierarchy. Um, kind of doing Aristotle's work, categorize and hierarchies. Yeah. And you can do that. And then you can see how all that lovely prose that you're so used to um, are just ideas in space. Yeah. And there isn't, there isn't any narrative that I couldn't make into a diagram. Not one. Well, that would be awkward for you. I, I think I think that's a challenge that's just been put out. I think the gauntlet has been thrown out to the people that are watching today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tweet him or at Ollie Cav if you've got any text that you think that he can't dual code. <laughs> yeah, <do>. Right. <laughs> uh, on the lighter one, interested in ideas or resources I could use to develop this more in the classroom. I'm obviously hesitant to say buy my book, but I mean, I buy my book. <laughs> um, or go to my website. Uh, I think 99% of it is free to download. If you yeah. comply with Creative Commons agreement, that's to say, don't change it. Um, I don't trust your design decisions. <laughs> 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 and also don't flog it, you know, don't use it to flog your gear. Otherwise it's all free to use. Um, really, that's, that, that's what I would say. I mean, I could really delve into design and everything, but that would take yeah. perhaps too long. Um, or yeah. perhaps I could answer here. Um, with design, um, yeah, my father was an architect. I've, uh, I've got a whole library full of, oh, yeah, a whole library full of design books. Um, um, but I've done a bit of, and all the design guides are too complicated. So I've done a bit of whole class feedback. I mean, over decades, I've looked at the mistakes that teachers made. And as in my era, they've become more digital, the mistakes have compounded. So the more choices they've got, the worse their creations are. So here are my four guides, and they're really simple. The first one is cut. Most teachers put too much information on their documents, their display boards, and their slides. So, I mean, if you want the complex term, Richard may call it the coherence principle, you know, cut. It's the easiest to understand, the easiest to do, and you have the biggest impact. The second one is chunk. Group things together because grouping is meaning making. So yeah. if you want children to understand what you've written, they'll understand the meaning. Mm. If you want them to get the meaning, then group things together. Otherwise, it's just a mess. Maybe an elegant mess, but it's a mess. So group things and make it visually apparent what's what. And use titles more. Um, Secondly, align things up. So just stop the obligation to be artistic and engage kids, because unless you're a professional artist, you'll make an awful mess of it. So what I recommend you do is instead of having Picasso and Matisse as your heroes in this respect, look at a railway timetable. Look at the weekend TV listings. Now, don't use as much as information because they're they're brilliant graphic experts how to do that. Look how everything's aligned. So your eye goes exactly where it needs to go. There's a hierarchy. They'll use bold and then less bold. Um, and lastly, the fourth one is restrain yourself. Just because you can get every color, every hue, every pattern, every free fancy display typeface, don't. One typeface, white plain background, small dabs of color. Because this is really, listen to the logic. If everything stands out, I'm gonna shout this at you now, nothing stands out. If everything stands out, nothing stands out. Decide which one or two things stand out and that's it. I mean, I, I've, got to, I've got to add a little anecdote to that. Um, one of my students loves, loves highlighters. Oh, yeah. Right, and um, when she first got her, her highlighters, she was so excited that the whole page and every page was highlighted. Yeah. <laughs> I think even as teachers, we do that, but we do that in a different way. Um, we say that everything is important and then we, we, the message gets lost in that. But uh, it always reminds me that you shout into the screen. I'm always, I think I'm, I'm going to create a GIF out of that, I think, and um, play it every time that happens in my classroom. Uh, good, good. <laughs>
Right. Uh, where do you want to jump to? There is a question at the top, and I know that you've highlighted some questions that you want to answer, but I think there is one that is, yeah. keeps jumping to the top. Um, the one from Jessica, and I think it kind of links with what's with now, but also I think just as a profession in general, because uh, there's been a lot about a workload, about um, well-being in general, even before the COVID situation, but obviously now more with uh, it's, it's been highlighted, uh, raised as an issue, in anxiety and depression. Uh, how does that impact working memory? Well, I'm not an expert on this, but in my reading <laughs> Buddhist studies, yeah. I learned the equation that an emotion is a thought and a physical sensation. Hmm. And when your thoughts and physical sensations are not about the subject matter you want to focus on, then they take up space. Yeah. Your working memory is, people consider that, it's like four slots from Nelson... Um, Cowan's work. So think of four slots. You're gonna. Two of those are going to be obsessed with something else. Mm. Of course, um, and it's easy to say calm down. But one way to calm down is to have everything organised. Don't have your desk or your paper or your screen with lots of stuff. Just pare it down. That gives you the confidence that you're masterful. I don't know what the feminine version of that is. Masterful. Um, um, so you, you can take things one thing at a time. So I think your environment really helps our emotional states express themselves externally. And at the same time, the external environment affects us. Mm. So if we organize the external environment to be something calm and measured, then it has an influence on us. But it definitely has an impact on working memory, yes. Yeah, and I think from a student perspective, um, and I think there's always been that challenge in terms of certain students seem to perform better than others and the impact that their home life has in terms of so some students can't create that that zen uh, environment at home um and and i think a lot more professionals over the last few years have been saying you know we really need to look at uh, and question the home situation and how we can make that easier um, yes. and if we can't then we definitely need to create that environment within our schools so that at least they have that pocket of in in their day where they they can experience that so so you know so i think uh, being mindful of it and i don't think we always have control over it i think uh, um but definitely it, you know it will have an impact um where do you want to jump to next i just want to say something else about that yeah um, the teacher the student in in addition to that home background can be overwhelmed with new information yeah. so i think teachers make an attempt to clarify what's important however that clarification is expressed in learning objectives and I think that's the wrong way. If I don't know anything about topic X, you giving me really clearly articulated learning objectives makes no sense because I don't know it. Mm. So if I go to a new town that I've never been before, telling me about it makes no sense until I'm in the town. Yeah. What I want to recommend is a really useful place to go is what the work that journalists do. They consider something called a stand first. It lives between the title of an article and the article and the discipline of editorial design because the way they can track eyes knows there's a single most important thing on a page or a screen and what that is is defined as a pithy pitch hmm. so using everyday language not abstractions using everyday language get to the nub of the meaning of what this new information you're going to be talking about is so you you, you write and think hmm. and communicate like a journalist so the meaning is conveyed in an easy to understand way from the beginning. So now the child, instead of being overwhelmed by the information, which soon becomes overwhelmed by the, the emotions of being, of being cognitively overwhelmed, they then become physically overwhelmed by these sensations of not coping. You calm it down, but you give the meaning first. I mean, that's, that's a, a brilliant way to visualize what you're saying in terms of, um, and also it's just cleansing the whole process as well from the student's perspective, yes. yeah. Uh, an interesting question here is, do you think that dual coding is more or less effective if teachers in one school use the same image for a concept or ideas across all subjects? I may be guilty, <laughs> really people will accuse me, of having started this fetish with icons. Particularly, you know, the Noun Project has two million icons and it's free, etc. Um, I think, and I haven't criticised teachers for doing it because they've started doing an activity for which they didn't have any confidence and they're building up. But generally people use icons too much. It's very difficult to get more than about a dozen icons. We don't know what they mean. Complete and utter guesswork. Mm. So 
in, in their diagrams, they're too big. They should be subservient to the words. They're like a visual trigger. An icon itself doesn't almost tell you anything. You, you're just guessing what they actually mean. So I think the question belies the fact that we think that dual coding visual information is visual. And I think that's story number one. Story number two is far more efficient. Mm. It's not about visual verbal. It's about linear and non-linear. So that the, instead of words in sentences, for example, that diagram that I showed you, a graphic organizer is just words. They're just words, but they're not stuck together with grammar or syntax. They are spatially organized, and it's a spatial, orga spatial organization that gives the meaning. But cognitive scientists consider that to be a visual, and there are no images there. Words in a nonlinear format are considered are categorized as being visual. And that is more important because the whole aim of visuals to me is to be subservient to and lead the children to better understand words and then better understand their, their understanding, sorry, explain their understanding. Absolutely. I had kind of that problem when I was in special school. There's this Makaton uh, signage symbol and symbol system. And the teacher were really clear, we only ever use Makaton. And of course, I was always a nuisance to everyone. I said, yeah, but they do live in the world, don't they? Yeah, so they do go down streets and see symbols that aren't Makaton symbols. What do they, what do, they do? They freak out. <laughs> they watch telly and they see symbols. What, what do they do? Do we disempower them? They say, no, you can't see them. So we have to face the fact that we see a whole load of different types of images. But the emphasis should, shouldn't be on the icons. It should be on the diagrams, the organizing mm -hmm. information, information designers. How are you going to get this concept across? And I think um, just in the professional world, I think that to do with nudge theory and all those different things, that's another interesting thing to look at in yes. terms of um, uh, how we use. And, uh, and again, it's very clear that it's not just imagery in terms of what we think. It's the words and everything else. How do we nudge behaviours? And, and learning is about nudging behaviours as well. And what's the most effective uh, and efficient way of doing that in a short amount of time which is what nudge theory is it's, and it's also the, the repetitive nature of it as well to reinforce okay where do you want to jump to next what would happen if you're not very good at drawing <laughs> uh, well, it's got nothing to do with drawing yeah. david hockney famously says if you can handwrite you can draw so on my in on my day course i have a five minute session where i teach you to draw like an architect where i teach you how to actually hold a pencil and some people still hold pencils, you know, in a weird grip. We all know how to hold a pencil, even though some of the younger teachers don't like to adopt that posture. Um, and that teacher had to, had to draw a line, a circle, and had to draw a spiral, an arc, and then you can draw anything. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's possible. But here's a secret tip. And when I've told people this, they go, wow, how brilliant. I thought, it's so obvious. So if you want to draw something, um, trace it get a bit of acetate or do it on screen with another layer and then that's really good because in the same way with language i've told you to get past all this verbiage and say verbally really concise sentence there's nothing more powerful than a sentence mm -hmm. the visual equivalent is if you say you're going to draw a car and they've got and there's background information you only want them to see the outline of the car get a big thick felt tip and just draw the outside line that's it hmm. and then you can show them you've got it it's a trace yeah trace the answer. where do you want to jump to next Oliver? Stephen Hoey says great I like it the science I mean, is there a simple way to get started now I hesitate to say this and I hope my wife isn't listening but, <laughs> um, there's another book in me I think whilst I devoted a number of pages of my dual coding book to graphic organizers and that's really where teachers should be focusing on then I think I mean I've got a book in me which would show you how to choose the right one, all the different types, how to construct it, how to model it, how to use it independently or in group work, how to integrate it with assessment for learning, how to use it for teacher explanation. But I don't know, I've got the time to do that. So I've, it's kind of a bit of a tease, but it, someone needs, needs to do that work. So I think you've just set yourself up there, Oliver. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> uh, someone asked me about yeah, the dreaded typeface comic song. Right, 
there is, I mean, I, I may be upsetting a lot of people here. There's so much, I mean, I come from a special needs background, spent all my life in special schools. And we talk about fads and fashions and myths. Special education was ahead of the game when it came to every fad, every myth going, special education had it. Um, so, and one of them, and the dyslexic one as well, there was one very small experiment in which they found that the use of comics saw the students were better able marginally to understand and recall. If you look at it, that means that when you give children something difficult to read, comics are a terrible typeface. When you give them something terrible to read, they have to have a bit more effort. And if you're doing an experiment, you, you will exert the effort for a short period of time, then you like to get better results. So it's unsustainable. Equally, I could have, I could have shown them it in Helvetica and I could have scribbled all, all over. So that would have, they would have raised, that would have um, triggered more effort. And I'd say, oh, scribbling on text is, is, is better for you. So I really wouldn't believe that. Uh, uh, there's loads of research to show that the, uh, is it the Erlen syndrome, where you have to have colored background? There's no scientific basis to that e either. So that whole special needs dyslexia field, it, field is filled with, with myths. So I personally would drop the comics are background. There was another question just from Stephen. It's only because yeah. I, I think it's quite good and I think it reinforces what you were saying. What Stephen said is, is it can teachers sometimes be wary of getting it wrong. So that's how, the whole thing about um, creating new misconceptions through getting our information wrong uh, and not trying things out. And should we be encouraging more experiments and risk taking? So this goes back to how as a teacher, I suppose as an educator, we're also in a journey with our students discovering ways that they can learn. Would this, how would that, how would dual coding and the, and the power of dual, dual coding impact that when there may be a fear of getting it wrong? I think a lot of it depends whether you are trying to capture someone else's information in which mm. case it needs to be accurate yeah and i don't know why we've got the assumption that a novice can do that so normally you have a novice new to the material and they haven't actually been taught how to construct a diagram and they haven't been taught which diagram to choose so that's disastrous. And you can make that as romantic as you want to, 21st century discovery, you know, we, we romanticize errors. We romanticize the idea of errors. You say, we look at um, creative types, advanced scientists, and they'll tell you, oh, errors is what it's all about. But they've done that on the basis of 20 years of study. So when you've got that knowledge, you can romanticize about errors. But for novices in school who know next to nothing, uh, uh, why would you want to introduce errors? But we can distinguish that with creativity. So for example, mind maps should be hierarchical. They're essentially tree diagrams. If you unpick a, a mind map, instead of being radiant and you make it horizontal, you'll see there are three or four or five tree diagrams. Now, Gabriella Rico invented a term called clustering. Um, and she taught creative writing in California in the 80s. And clustering may look like a mind map, but it's just associations. Mm -hmm. So you, you have a word, oh, that makes me think of that. that. So for the creative writing purpose, you get everything out and, you tr and the more you see it, the more it triggers more words. So, so the intellectual process of just generating ideas, you don't want hierarchies because you don't want to stop the flow by saying, ah, oh, which is the superordinate and the subordinate here? You know, mm -hmm. So we need to be really clear what we're talking about. Is it capturing already established knowledge for which we need accuracy? Or is it just the creative process, which is something else? So, I mean, definitely. I mean, you, it all stems from your own personal confidence uh, in terms of being able to explore it and do it in the right way. So, um, so uh, definitely exploring this a lot more before you start using it as a, a model that you want to use on a consistent basis within your classrooms. There's quite a few practical questions. Um, that I people answer are... one now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What if I ask pupils to copy a visual step by step as I draw it, step by step? So this is a particular thing that I do on my, on my course. So I recommend it highly. So you explain something and as you explain it, perhaps not draw it unless you've got to have a visualizer, 
um, or you're already creating it on a PowerPoint or so, so it comes up gradually so you can always need to look at your so you're talking explaining and engaging them with your narrative and the diagram bit by bit continues then it, that's only part of a diagram then you get the students to copy it but before you go to the next part you get students that is really significant thing is you get and we know peer explanation is really useful you say to them i use a new gesture i used all these words and then i contracted the words down into keywords and i want you to explain that part of the diagram to your partner i want you to do the opposite i want you to expand it i want you to you can't just say the keywords i want you to create sentences and you use the index finger of the hand that you write with and you physically place it on the paper screen and you trace you draw the line with your finger under the word that you're expanding and you continue that and perhaps at the end they, they do the whole thing to each other and you take turns on oh, by when the when the student is listening to their partner they're not just passive they too will put their finger on their diagram and they will trace the part in coordination with their partner's explanation and then by the end if you take the diagram away they could redraw it perfectly like a photocopier so i want you to imagine the possibilities of starting a new topic and you've done the brilliant thing of condensing the essential information so it's always interesting when you get to the to the nitty-gritty of what it's all about you go through this process with your students you know they've got this core model firmly fixed in their head so you redraw it in a lesson you redraw it two days later you redraw it a week later and then it's pretty much there forever they have this incredible confidence that um that wow i i can know this stuff mm. i've mastered it it's not mysterious i don't feel silly i've got it it's there it's in me and i can bring it out whenever i want to and then you can do depending on the journey from novice to expert and independence you can do all the more elaborate group work discovery stuff but it's built upon this framework Right down at the bottom, we've got Nora as well, who just said um, about, um, and we kind of touched on it, curriculum learning journey graphic organisers. Oh, yeah, I've seen those. Um, I don't think they have any cognitive benefits. And sometimes, as some people said, you know, a table will be just as, just as useful. However, I want to talk about knowledge organisers. Well, I'll come back to teacher. I'm going to talk about the students first of all. A knowledge organiser, um, I think, is a misnomer. I think they're really useful. They're really useful. The thing is, Frederick Reef, in his book, Applying Cognitive Science to Education, has a hierarchy of organising structures. One's random. Next is a list. By the way, notice I'm going up. Up is more. <laughs> then a network, which is like interrelated and complex. And then there's a tree diagram. So a list is near the bottom of organizational structures of efficiency. So to call what we're calling knowledge organizers is really giving it more accolade than it deserves. They're just a bunch of lists. Hmm. I see those as being as important as a list of ingredients when you cook. Essential, but really, really insufficient. Hmm. What I think we could do is we're not going to change the word. So we call them knowledge organizers. And I think what we need is a knowledge schema, which mm. is the diagrams. Which, yeah. So then you, which is more like the, which is more like the recipe. How did the ingredients interrelate to each other? Mm. Because that's where the meaning is. Lists have no meaning. Diagrams have meaning. Mm. And we talk a lot about schemas now. I thought the word had disappeared from teachers vocabulary. <laughs> Schemas, nearly every cognitive science book you read will depict a schema in non-linear format. So here what I think is the essential, here's the role that diagrams play. There's an essential dynamic going in every classroom. Nearly all the information that students receive is linear, linear, and their schema is non-linear. Yeah. A diagram gets you halfway there to understanding it, and use the other way out to help children explain what they know becomes a rehearsal for writing it. Essentially, it's not the complete picture and, and we can add to that to actually give it, to give it the meaning that it needs. I've just realised what the time is. I'm absolutely okay. completely absorbed and engrossed in, in, in this, uh, this whole discussion. It, it's 9.58. 
and I did say I was going to give you a nod before we got to this point. That's, that, that's my fault. Um, but I think um, I think we've covered quite, we've hit a lot of the bases that I think uh, uh, have been asked today. Um, and I and I really thank you and anybody that's seen all of the live, as in in person, uh, in a session, will know how engaging live is. But actually, it's completely translated into today as well. Uh, as I said, I've, I don't think I've ever. Uh, laugh during a dual coding session or anything of this level before especially on a Friday at the end of a really heavy week uh, so I, I'm going to personally thank you for that that uh, to actually just make it a lot clearer in terms of where we are what this is and and if we want to use this how we actually effectively move forward and uh, what would be really really good is if you could if there are any key links that you want to share on twitter i think a lot of people will benefit even if it's just some obvious ones that you think well everybody should know this if you can just share some of the stuff that you know that is a go is a go-to place including your own work obviously and that would be really really helpful and if you use the hashtag ld edu chat um, so i want to thank you oliver uh, for rounding off a fantastic week in such a brilliant way thanks for inviting me it's been great and thank no, you no. for the great and I really enjoyed it. Um, and um, so that's the end of another fantastic week. As I said, this week we've had a whole journey of discovery and reflection, some classroom based, some school based, some leadership based, and some just um, the moral purpose that we. Uh, we strive to work towards. Um, I just want to tell you what's coming up in the next week. Um, so now heading into the end of July, last few days of Ju uh, sorry June, um, and going into July. So on Monday we have Leora Crudders, who will be looking at leadership things to consider for 2021 and 2020. Sorry, 2020 and 2021. And then we're going to be looking at is a session that was added quite uh, later on. So do go into that one. It's by Hannah Wilson. Um, Hannah Wilson is from Diversity Ed, amongst lots of other things that she does. And she's looking at flex uh, flexible working and what the new normal could look like from our profession's point of view. And then on Wednesday, from two of our trust outstanding schools, one that's been outstanding for a while, which is um, Cholney High School for Boys, and we have the head teacher there, Daniel. Connor joining him we've got a recently going from a double RI into uh, an outstanding which is an amazing achievement is Cholney High School for Girls we've got Joe Miles who's the head teacher there will be looking at educational excellence and then we've got Amjad Ali from uh, who's a senior leader within a school but also a co-founder of Baymed and it's how to recruit a diverse team this is something that I think is an absolute must for people if they're now looking to plan how they how their new future looks within their schools and then we round off with the brilliant Joe Richardson who's been so supportive of what we've done um, and has engaged with the process that we've and the journey that we've been on and he's looking at school improvement and what should our priorities be um, so that's the fantastic week we have ahead of us it's a packed week it's five sessions next week do make sure you head on over to um, our Chilton Teaching School Alliance YouTube channel especially if you are finding it difficult with your new schedules at work to hook into the live sessions everything is made available on our Teaching, teaching School Alliance uh, YouTube channel engage with us on Twitter make sure you share your thoughts and as I said to you right at the beginning need to be present to see what's coming up so do stay tuned we have some big announcements about some future projects that we are working on coming up in the next week so this is me Arv Kaushal signing off for another session and another week of hashtag LD Edu chat and I really hope you have a restful weekend and I look forward to seeing you on Monday morning thank you <laughs>